Hey, and welcome to Foolproof Theology. I'm your host, Chase Davis. I'm excited to dive into our topic this week. I wanted to spend a little bit of time talking about John Calvin, Theodore Beza, and the company of pastors there in Geneva uh, back when the Black Plague broke out in their town. The reason I really am curious about this topic is, well, it, it should seem obvious to us. I mean, with the global pandemic that our our world has really been living through for, I think, almost 15 months, although if you look at different reports on when it broke and who got infected when, it could have been up to two years almost at this point. And I think it's really important to look back at history because it can help us understand how to love people well, how to honor the Lord, and really uh, articulate some of the tensions that probably many of us have been feeling. And so what we're going to be doing is looking at a book. I'm going to be reading some of it. Uh, it's called Calvin's Company of Pastors. That's the cover. This was recommended to me by Brian Brown, one of my good friends here in the Denver area. This is Calvin's Company of Pastors. It's subtitled Pastoral Care in the Emerging Reformed Church, 1536 to 1609 by Scott Manich. Manich. And uh, and I'm hoping that I can reach out to him, get him on the podcast, because I'm going gonna, I'm be, I'm gonna to be using his material here as a kind of a primary source. Um, and I'm, I'm, I want to work through a section on page 284. This is a section where pastoral visitation was kind of an expectation in Geneva. Uh, if you don't know Calvin and Geneva and the company of pastors there, they were trying to do something new uh, out of the Reformation where they had civil magistrates. They had kind of ruling authorities in the town, but they were trying to have a high role in shaping the society they were in. And so they were trying to impact culture, shape culture. They had a lot of ma- a lot of influence, a uh, high degree of control over uh, over the culture there in Geneva. And so part of their kind of handbook, their guidebook on being a pastor, being a minister in Geneva was to actually practice pastoral visitation. And it was expected that pastors would go visit the jails, would go visit the hospitals. And you can kind of see this tradition play out today. You can see it play out um, when you go to the hospital. I'm a pastor. And so it'll say parking for ministers at our local hospital here in Boulder County. Um, You have parking right up front if you're a pastor, if you're doing a pastoral visitation, which I've utilized before. And so pastoral visitation is something that that's been around for a long time, and it still continues to this day, visiting people who are shut in, stuck in their home because they can't visit, um, which has happened a lot. And that's why online church has some redeeming, redeeming qualities, at least, because people can uh, participate in hearing the sermon, um, even if they're not able to make it in person for whatever uh, reason, whatever condition they have. And so pastoral visitation was something that they expected all to participate in. If you were a minister, you would participate in it. Um, it proved to be quite a challenge during a breakout of the plague. Now, the plague was a very different uh, sort of sickness uh, than we have today, uh, particularly when we look at the statistics and we look at the intervention methods that were able to be utilized back then and the way we can measure uh, the deadliness of plagues. And I'm not pretending to be a virologist or or a scientist in that regard, but it, it's pretty obvious the Black Plague was a pretty severe affliction. Um, who knows if there might have been countermeasures that could have been employed that would have diminished uh, the impact. Um, but we're talking over 10% of people who were infected with it died, at least. I mean, it, it ranges because it was so long ago, but very high death rate compared to comparatively to something we're dealing with with today. And and they believe that the visitation of the sick was among the most important duties expected of the pastors from week to week. Um, it was the the expectation that a minister would be visiting the sick. This is why at our church, we whenever we gather as elders, one of the points that we then emphasize is how can we pray for the sick? Who's sick in our body? Who needs visitation in our body? What can we do to care for those who are sick in our church? And so the plague arrives in Geneva in the fall of 1542. And what they did for Geneva is they actually relocated uh, or they built a hospital outside of the town. Um, it was out by actually the uh, the cemetery um, so that they could care for the sick. Um, and so several uh, on page 284, it says it was located several hundred yards outside of the walled city next to the place of actually execution in the cemetery. And so during seasons when the scourge of this disease threatened the city, the company of 
pastors, members of them, were appointed to go visit the hospital to provide spiritual consolation to the spiritually ill and dying. And this is something that's gone on throughout church history. One of the ways that Christianity had such an impact in the early church is that when plagues or when viruses or whatever happened in the early church would, would come to local towns and local populations, uh, ministers would go out and minister to people, take care of people and and, um, and pray for them and provide relief from their ailments, all that kind of thing. And so this is something Christians have always done. Uh, it's what's so strange nowadays when we're being told that we're not allowed to be in contact with other people when we serve a risen, physically risen our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is, lives today physically, and a huge part of our ministry has always been an embodied uh, spirituality, not not just an online spirituality, but an embodied spirituality. Uh, and if you want to hear more about that, you can kind of go to one of my previous episodes on Gnosticism and the church. But they had people that would volunteer. They had people that were scared to do this, that were scared to take care of people, one of the guys named Pierre, he went out and he committed to live out there outside the city and visit the plague hospital so he could take care of these people and minister to them. Um, and so he would do this and and this kind of had a seasonality to it. Um, one of the things that Calvin advised was that pastors shouldn't jeopardize the well-being of the larger church for the sake of caring for individual persons, but even so, duty must always trump fear. So he said this in a letter, so long as we are in this ministry, I do not see it that any pretext will avail us if, through fear of infection, we are found wanting in the discharge of our duty where there is most need of our assistance. And in another letter, Calvin wrote, the pestilence also begins to rage here with greater violence and few who are, are, are at all affected by it escape its ravages. So they're seeing a pretty high death rate. One of our colleagues was to be set apart for attendance upon the sick because Pierre offered himself all readily acquiesced. So nobody really wants to do this, uh, is what you're picking up on. If anything happens to Pierre, I fear that I must take the risk upon myself, for as you observe, because we are debtors to one another, we must not be wanting to those who more than any other stand in need of our ministry. So caring for the sick was a huge part, is a huge part of ministry in Calvin's mind. Um, and so they actually practiced several things. The magistrates took aggressive steps, steps to try to contain the uh, epidemic. This is on page 285. It says dogs and cats are thought to be, were thought to be carriers of the disease, and so they were all exterminated. Um, the law courts were closed until after the harvest. The sick were confined at home or sent to the plague hospital, so they're obviously not quarantining the healthy there. Um, and then you've got this guy, Pierre, he keeps volunteering to go out there, but by the end of the month, he had contracted the disease and died himself. And so it becomes kind of a crisis. No one from the company was actually willing to undertake the assignment. At the same time, the local authorities mandated that Calvin should be removed from the potential candidates to go out there. And so there's kind of a tension. It says, if, out, not, if not outright resentment against Calvin, uh, because he's a special. And so they say, you're not allowed to go to this hospital. We don't want you visiting this hospital. And then some people even remove their, uh, remove their names from this roster to go visit the hospital. It says, even though it belongs to their office, God has still not given them the grace of strength and constancy needed to go to said hospital. Um, and a guy volunteer steps forward. He contracted the disease and died. And so they keep volunteering and keep dying. Not all of them. Some of them don't volunteer. Um, and so there were these tensions that they wrestled with, with how do we care for the sick if we ourselves get sick? How do we not make it worse for other people if we get uh, afflicted with this sickness? Um, and so how do we care for the sick and dying? It says, should the responsibility of providing spiritual care for plague victims fall on one or two men alone? Or should all of Geneva's ministers be involved in the crucial pastoral work despite the risk? So there were lots of questions they were asking. Several months after Calvin's death, when the uh, in 1564, when the plague returned to Geneva, um, they debated again what to do. And this time, Theodore Beza, who was in charge, um, he did not want to be exempt from the lottery of pastors who were kind of called to go there. Uh, even though all of them said, "You can't do this. You are a leader. You can't go out to the." Uh, to the plague hospital. Even Calvin himself had visited plague victims when he served the French, a French congregation in Strasbourg, but Beza's name was removed from consideration. And so he, his name is removed. Um, 
the this epidemic returns again. So this is coming again and again against these company of pastors against Geneva. As many as 3,000 townspeople died of the plague um, in about a four-year time period. And so the uh, civil authorities detained, interrogated, and tortured more than 100 people under suspicion of being witches or plague spreaders. Those who confessed were executed by burning at Champel outside the city. During the course of the protracted crisis, the ministers enacted important changes in their protocol for caring for the sick and dying. Before 1570, the company of pastors continued to employ the lottery system. By 1570, however, Beza, as the moderator of the company, found this pastoral approach unacceptable. Beza insisted that he should be included in the lottery. As a minister of the gospel, he argued it was his responsibility before God to fulfill all the duties that his office required, which included chiefly the consolation of poor, sick people. The responsibility of overseeing pastoral care for the sick belonged to the church, not the civil magistrates, not the local government. And so it was the church who was supposed to be in there taking care of people and ministering to people. Now, this is all changed nowadays where we had denominations and Christians founding hospitals to care for the sick. And so there, there's obviously not a one-for-one -one correlation when you look historically. That would be uh, trying to moralize history. But I think there's important principles uh, to pull out of this, that there should be there should be some sort of spiritual care for people who are sick, who are hurting. Um, this plague tested the uh, the town and, and Geneva and its resiliency. And um, like some of the questions that ask here, did a minister defy God's providence when he employed safeguards to protect himself from the plague? Did a pastor's obligations to his wife and his family supersede his responsibility to a spiritual flock? Was it ever justifiable for a pastor to abandon a sick parishioner in the interest of self-preservation? Beza addressed these questions directly in a small treatise entitled Questions Regarding the Plague, uh, 1579. And so what he did in that is he tried to address these questions uh, because he was trying to train up the next generation generation of pastor or pastors to take care of sick people. Um, while Beza agreed that plagues were sent by the providence of God to punish sinners, which is an interesting take, right? Then one that we probably wouldn't uh, be comfortable with today, he rejected its conclusions to say that diseases were sent by God and no way precluded the possibility that God also accomplished the providential dis his providential designs to heal or kill through various secondary causes, whether they be medicines or infectious diseases. Scripture made clear that the poison of vipers was deadly and diseases such as leprosy contagious. Experience also determined I'm sorry, demonstrated that many diseases are contracted by handling and touching and that medicines were sometimes helpful to counteract the effects of illness. Hence, Beza noted, even as God has ordained that some people will not die from the plague, so also he has appointed remedies, which as, as much as it is in their power, people may use to avoid the danger of the plague. And so this gets into the question of vaccinations and medicines and other things that Christians can take uh, to avoid the threat of the plague. And so... You know, I, I wanted to share this mainly because I think it's helpful to calm down a lot of the uh, heated rhetoric, a lot of the fear. Um, how so? Because if we look back at history and we look back at the history of the church, the church has been dealing with this kind of stuff for centuries, for thousands of years. And so ours is not the first generation to face such a crisis. Does it feel more intense because it's more global, because we feel more connected over the Internet? Yeah, it feels that way. But can you imagine for a second how they felt, how isolated they felt with no electricity, with no uh, no understanding of how viruses work? Can you imagine how afraid they felt? I mean, they were they were interrogating people because they believed that witches were spreading this thing. That's how scared they were. And a lot of people today are scared. And what people need is spiritual consolation, knowing that God rules and reigns, that he's sovereign, and that we can trust God's purposes in the world. Let's keep looking at what Beza said. He also turned his attention to the practical question of whether and under what circumstances Christians should flee from a deadly plague. Beza's general advice was this, it was perfectly acceptable, indeed wise, for Christians to flee the plague as long as they fulfilled the du their duty of piety toward God and charity toward their neighbors. Both reason and experience demonstrated that flight was one of the most effective strategies for avoiding infectious disease. Nevertheless, men and women who contemplated flight were warned that they must never place their own safety above that of their spouses, families, neighbors, and fellow citizens. When the choice was not clear, Beza suggested that those Christians who were less capable, culpable, 
who remained behind when they might have fled than those who fled when they should have remained behind. This then was based as advice for the majority of Christian men and women. However, those whom God had placed in public offices, such as magistrates and as Christian ministers, had greater responsibility for the common good during times of extreme danger and plague. Bezos stated the requirements of pastors in uncompromising terms. It would be something very shameful, indeed wicked, to even imagine a faithful pastor who abandons one of his poor sheep in the hour when he especially needs heavenly consolation. I just think that's a powerful picture of ministry, of caring for people, of loving people, of serving people. Um, and so he shares this personal example Later on in his life, Beza does. He says, about 28 years ago, when I was sick with the plague in Lausanne, my other colleagues, including the exceptional men of blessed memory, Pierre Verret, were prepared to visit me. And John Calvin himself also sent by courier letters in which he offered every type of kindness to me. But I did not permit any of them to visit me, lest I should be judged to have been thinking only of myself. For the disadvantage to the Christian commonwealth would have been very great had those illustrious men died. And so he has great respect for these men. Um, even when he was sick himself with the plague, he didn't want anyone uh, to come visit him. Beza would have thrown all caution to the wind to visit his two friends at their sick beds, but he didn't want them to visit him. This was not only the responsibility of a friend, it was the duty of a pastor. And so I think this episode is helpful just because it helps broaden our perspective on our times. We can feel trapped, uh, confused, powerless over. Uh, you know, government mandates or, or edicts, wherever you are in the world watching or listening, we can feel powerless. And I think that when we remember the power of God and the responsibility we have before God, the duty that we have to God uh, because of the gospel to care for people that are sick and needy, um, it, it makes these more global concerns more local because all of a sudden we, we really need to focus on those in our lives who we are responsible to, who we have a direct impact over, who we are actually around physically, um, whether it's family we live near or our, our Christian neighbors and non-Christian neighbors that we're near, people we work with, people in our neighborhood. Um, of course, it's, it's correct and wise to pray for all people everywhere and to pray for people especially who are sick. Uh, but... I think what we can tend to do is get so wrapped up, or at least what I can tend to do is get so wrapped up in what's going on out there that I can't control, that we forget our Christian duty here and now is to preach the gospel to those who are afraid. And that's the hope we have in the face of, uh, of a pandemic is that we have the hope of Christ. Does that mean it's not scary? Does that mean it's not unnerving? Does it not mean it's not frustrating to deal with complicated viruses that that we have a lot of debates about? No, but it does mean that if we have the hope of Christ, then we have something to offer to other people. We have the hope of Christ to offer to other people who are in desperate need of it. We're watching a whole society convulse because there's a lack of a knowledge of God. There's a lack of appreciation of his sovereignty and his goodness and his faithfulness. And so what we have instead is an, an, an overreaction where we don't know God and we don't honor God, and we don't love God, just in general as a society. And so all we think we have is our life now. The, the phrase YOLO just rings in my mind when I think about how our society is reacting against this particular virus, which means that our society is going to take measures that really don't honor God. Um, they're going to do anything they can to protect the one life that we think we have. And what Calvin did and what the pastors of Geneva did is they took reasonable measures to do what they could uh, to protect life, to love one another, to, to practice self-sacrifice as Christians. But what they didn't do is, uh, is disbelieve God or distrust God. And so if there's anything I want to share with you, it's just mainly the faithfulness of these men that have come before us. And hopefully it inspires you in your faith to remain faithful, to remain uh, true to what God expects of us. And to really pray for those who are vulnerable and sick around us. Uh, visit them, pray for them, take care of them, take care of their needs. It's what Christians have done and it's what Christians should do because that's what God does for us. So I hope sharing this with you has been interesting and helpful. I'm going to be sharing more church history with you um, as things 
kind of unfold in my own uh, kind of ambitions with church history and studying that and, and doing more research in that area. Um, I'm hoping to have Dr. Owen Anderson on soon to talk about critical theory and kind of how a lot of our world and the uh, the experiences we've had over the last two years mimic kind of a religious revival. And so I'm hoping to have him on soon. If you like this episode, I'd love if you subscribe, share it with someone else, give us a good review on on Apple Podcast or wherever you're listening and send this podcast to someone you think might be blessed or encouraged by it or challenged by it so that you guys can have a conversation and connect and love God and love others more. Until then, we'll see you next time.